Last year when most investors were watching their stocks plummet, one Wall Street legend had an unfair advantage that was identifying winning stocks with massive upside. Like Riot Blockchain before it shot up 10,090%, Digital Turbine before it shot up 789%, Overstock.com before it shot up 1,050%. This power gauge comes from the legendary Mark Chaikin. Right now, you can get a free in-depth look at how his power gauge system works. A way to type in any of 4,000 different tickers and see exactly where the stock is most likely to go next and in any type of market. Simply go to PowerGagePreview.com for a free look. Again, that's PowerGagePreview.com. Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's the 5th of April, 2022. It's a Tuesday. We got a big show coming up. There's a lot going on. I know I promised the look ahead for the second quarter. I promise it's coming out Thursday. A few things I really wanted to cover, some news that came out over the weekend. We have a, really a, a heck of a rally in the market, pulling back a little bit today, but we have a lot to dive into. We're gonna talk about nuclear energy. We're gonna talk about LNG. Everything that's going on right now with Russia and energy is huge investment opportunities popping up everywhere, and I got names. I am naming names today, all coming up right now on Making Money. Again, this is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It is April 5th, 2022. It is a Tuesday. And you can see a little bit of a different background. And you're going to continue to see different backgrounds for about another week. Until we get the crew down here. I'm in a new place down here in Florida. We're going to set up a nice little studio. And it's going to be rocking and rolling from there. Uh, so bear with us as we get kind of set up for the, the new studio we're building. And uh, once that's ready to go next week, you're going to love it. It's going to look very professional, very nice. But at the end of the day, we're still going to give you the same information. So let's dive into the markets and catch up what we've what we've seen in the market since last week. You can see here the S&P 500. Uh, we're about 50 minutes into trading so far here on Tuesday morning. Uh, we're at the lows of the session right now, down about six tenths of a percent on the S&P 500. We were up earlier, uh, but we've have uh, sold off here. You know, it's it's been a bit of a uh, uh, odd market in the last couple of days um, because what we've seen is. The market hit new multi-month highs last week, and then we had two big sell-off days, and then two rally backs. Uh, you know, Friday then we had a big day yesterday to start the week, and now selling off. So a lot of volatility. But what I'll show you here in the chart, though, what I like is you know, this is a 200-day moving average, this blue line. You know, we broke up here above a resistance level. We're consolidating as long as the spies, the SPY, stays above this 450 area. It looks really good. And, and again, that 450 area, give or take a, a point you know, here or there, it's not perfect. Uh, but in this area right here, it is really still long term positive to me. But what I want to talk about here is uh, some, some of the big the biggest banks in the world came out recently and they, they gave their view on, on the market and they're a bit torn from from what I got. So let's start with Bank of America. Uh, they came out this week, and uh, uh, this is a quote from, from one of our analysts. They said, over the last two weeks, the S&P 500 has produced one of its sharpest rallies in history, larger than the biggest 10-day rallies in seven of the S&P's 11 bear markets since 1927. You know, it, it, they went on to say that it's done so despite clearly weaker fundamentals, more rate hikes, higher inflation, yield curve inversion. First of all, they're talking about rallies in a bear market. We're not in a bear market in the S&P 500, so that, that's absolutely ridiculous. You're, you're comparing apples to oranges, uh, number one. Number two, they're telling us everything we know. We know there's more rate hikes coming. We know we have high inflation. We know the yield curve inverted. Weaker fundamentals, that, that's all priced into the market. I mean, I mean, if anybody out there says, I'm going to sell now because we have high inflation, or if we're gonna, I'm going to sell now because more interest rates coming or yield curve inversion, that was all really, that was telegraphed. I mean, it's just, it's, it's fascinating to me that, to see how these firms, these multi, multi-billion dollar firms managing some of the biggest money in the world, uh, you know, unless they're just doing this and, and they're telling their, their wealthy clients something else, well, this is all known. And again, the facts aren't even true. They're talking, they're comparing the rally 
to the uh, bear markets that we've had 11 in the S&P 500 since 1927 and are calling it one of the biggest 10-day rallies. We're not in a bear market. We are in a correction in the S&P 500, but we never went into bear market territory. So Bank of America, throw that crap out the window. Morgan Stanley, they came out and said, the bear market rally is over. That was a quote. Again, am I missing something? Because the S&P 500 did not go into bear market territory. Uh, they went on to talk about the economy. It's heading for a sharp slowdown. Uh, this was another quote that they said. Uh, Payback and demand from last year's fiscal stimulus. Uh, demand destruction from high prices. Food and energy prices spike from the war that serve as a tax and inventory builds that have now caught up to demand. Yes, inventory builds needed to catch up to demand because the supply chain was so screwed up. But now we're back to where we should be. It's not as if we have inventory sitting there and nobody suddenly is buying anything. We have wages that are increasing at a really good clip, not as high as they should be with inflation, but at a really good clip. I talked about that uh, last week in one of my daily reports. So again, they're pulling information, but not giving you the full story. Uh, it, it's it, To me, it's it's... It's crazy. And the guy who came out with this at Morgan Stanley, his last name is Wilson. He was bearish all through 2021 when the market was rallying. So a lot of times, and he actually admitted he's wrong. I will give him that. But a lot of times the, these perma bears, they just keep going. They, they don't change their tune. And some people will say that about me, about being perma bullish. But again, you look at the stock market over the last 100 plus years, it goes up. So I'm playing the odds. Sure, there's going to be times I'm going to say, listen, we got to pull some back. But right now, we have not had any sustained downturn in the market in a long time. Will one happen? Yes, folks, it will. But as I've talked about again last week, when a yield curve invert, inverts, which it has, typically it takes about 18 months for it to even uh, affect the market till the market peaks. That's 18 months. And, and again, I mentioned last week, the average rally in 18 months, the S&P 500, is a high 20% range. That's huge gains from here. Think about what your portfolio will look like up 28% from here in 18 months. That's a ton of money. So again, you, we have to look at this and just, my goodness, like, uh, you just we take it all in. I read all this stuff, but push the garbage aside, which this is garbage so far. JP Morgan also came out, and this was their quote. Uh, Geopolitics remains a wild card, but we do not see equities fundamental uh, risk reward to be as bearish as it is currently fashionable to portray. So I actually agree with that uh, for the most part. Um, also, Jamie Dimon, their CEO, uh, came out and uh, you know he, he basically talked about the strength of the U.S. economy in his annual letter to shareholders that came out on Monday. He cited plentiful jobs with wage increases I just talked about. And this is something else I've mentioned from time to time, but uh, Dimon came out and said, you know, more than $2 trillion in excess savings right now. So a lot of times people compare what's going on to the great financial crisis, the GFC, as they call it. Uh, 2008, 2009. We were not sitting on a ton of cash at that time. Banks and companies were highly leveraged. We're the exact opposite right now. Households were highly leveraged. We're the exact opposite right now. So I don't see that we're in the same situation uh, as, as we were there. And um, he went on to say, and I don't, I don't know this for a fact, but this is what Diamond said. This is his quote, among the lowest on record when referring to leverage. And I have to agree we're probably there because we have so much cash. So again, it's, it's very rare that we would have a deep recession or deep bear market when you're sitting on so much cash. It just doesn't happen historically. I had on a financial news network yesterday. I'm going to stop saying the names of them because I feel like I don't want to bash them, uh, you know, specifically. But I was listening to one yesterday on my TV right over here, and uh, everybody was calling for a recession. Everybody on there was bearish. It was... And, I swear the hosts get like giddy over it. Like they, it's like, ooh, like they just had like a, like a nice first date or something. It's crazy. I mean, I don't know why people are so negative in, in this world, especially the media, but you know, it sells, I guess. So for the markets right now, folks, as I just, you know, kind of, I probably alluded to with what I said, I remain bullish on, a, on an intermediate term and long term. In a short term, we can pull back. We had a hell of a rally. We can consolidate, we can pull back. But I think there's still great opportunities out there. So again, let's let's keep that in mind. The topics I want to talk about today, again, Thursday's show, we're going to take a, a recap of Q1 and take a look, more importantly, at the future, uh, Q2 and beyond, uh, talk about some sectors and some specific stocks uh, that look good that add to your watch list. Again, when it comes to stocks, I'm about to talk about a couple of stocks here in a minute. Uh, keep in mind, nothing here is a buy or sell recommendation, uh, just education. 
And we're here to educate you, have fun, and of course, make some money, but do your own due diligence, please. So I want to talk about um, an article that I read over the weekend, and this is from the UK, uh, United Kingdom. And uh, they have a plan that they're calling the Great British Nuclear. And uh, UK is considering adding six to seven new uh, nuclear power plants, power stations by 2050. I know it sounds like a long ways away, 28 years, obviously, uh, but it takes a while to build them. Uh, and on Thursday, they're supposed to unveil the plan. You know, today's Tuesday. And uh, from what I gather, they're going to have two new plants, hopefully up and running by 2030, which is pretty quick. And a bunch of smaller modular reactors called SMRs. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. There's a, there's a huge investment opportunity there, I believe. So let's go back, though, and talk about nuclear energy because it's often viewed as dirty. It is often viewed as extremely dangerous. And I've talked about this in the past. You know, we had Chernobyl. It's a one-off. That was not built correctly. It was not run correctly. That could, that, you know, that could happen, but that was just not run right. Uh, Three Mile Island in my home state of Pennsylvania, again, contained very easily. So, and then Fukushima, which was built on the coast where it shouldn't have been built, where a tsunami uh, caused mass destruction, unfortunately. So very anomalies, you know, one-off anomalies that if things are done right, which I think we've learned from that, uh, you don't build them on, on areas where there could be a potential earthquake, et cetera. You know, that, that, that's all common sense, but we, you know, anything can happen where common sense doesn't come into place. Well, we, let's assume common sense is. If that's the, the, the case, you know, no harmful greenhouse gases come from nuke plants. It's a fact. Um, you know, and, and you think about the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it's really forcing a lot of countries, especially European Union countries, to, to rethink their supply, their energy supply, and, and more importantly, uh, their energy security, you know, not having to rely on a country like Russia or maybe the Middle East who aren't as friendly as they uh, should be or, or not should be, but not as friendly as, as they would like. And um, to put this into numbers, folks, you know, the EU imports 41 percent of its natural gas from Russia. So that's that's a really big number. And. You know, going back to how nuclear energy right now is as far as global consumption, I'm going to bring up a chart here. Only 4.4% of the global energy consumption in 2020 came from nuclear energy. U.S. is about 8.4%, so a little bit higher. But let's take a look at this chart. Here you can see the global primary energy consumption by source. Uh, biomass down here. You have coal, still a huge amount. Obviously, oil and gas, so fossil fuels, a huge amount. And then you see nukes right there. It's about 4.4%, that little reddish then. And then above that, hydropower. And what's also fascinating, I'm not going to talk about this specifically today, but wind and solar and other renewables, look how small it is. So even though that grows you know, to half, it's a huge upside potential. Um, so that's something, again, to keep an eye on right there. Uh, and I, I love the renewables as an investment. Um, and we'll talk about that more in other shows. But right now, I'm going to talk about nuclear. And again, only 4.4%. Um, the next chart here I, I want to show you, this kind of breaks down uh, countries. And it shows here in the EU, uh, in Europe, this is for 2020, the net energy consumption, uh, nuclear minus gas. So for example, you can see France here, um, they get about 37% of their power from nukes, uh, which obviously is much more than they get from gas. But you go down to Germany, down here in the bottom left, this is the continent's largest economy. And they rely heavily on gas, and they rely heavily on Russia. Also Italy, UK, and that's why they're going to nuclear right now. So the much more, and some of these really big uh, countries down here, up here all you have is France, Sweden, Finland, uh, Switzerland, Bulgaria, and Slovenia, the rest are either kind of flat or uh, heavily reliant on gas, again, which goes back to heavily relying on Russia. And I already told you that the EU imports about 41% of its natural gas from Russia. All that being said, we're starting to see a bit of a swap here, folks. Um, Belgium came out recently and uh, they, uh, they had plans to shut down um, uh, their nuclear power plants in the country but now being reconsidered because of what's going on. And I think we'll probably see that in a lot more countries. Germany, where their leaders, they continue to you know, disavow nuclear energy. Uh, the, but there's a, uh, the minister president of a region, um, a Bavarian region, uh, they, you know, he's calling, listen, we need to extend the life of these nuclear power plants. And maybe they won't build, build new ones, but when you're relying that heavily, nearly half of all their gas in Germany, the continent's largest economy, it's coming from Russia. 
And you know, the the one pipeline and the, the other other one was about getting ready to open, and they they nixed that, and they can't nix the other one because Germany would go into an immediate recession because they would have no damn energy, so they can't do that. But you know, they get forty nine percent of their gas from Russia, from Russia, man. So. You know, uh, according to Bloomberg, uh, Germany's nuclear power generation in 2021, so this last year, was down 60% from its peak. So maybe that has to pick up or at least stay where it's at. To, to at least, because how else can you get off Russian gas? I just don't know how you're going to do it. You can't quickly get solar and wind. It just doesn't come that fast. UK's um, nuclear power generation in 2021 was down 50% from its peak. And obviously, they're going to start going back because they see the upside potential. This is a clean energy, folks. Japan, because of Fukushima, their peak energy from nuclear energy down 87%. So, you know, I just showed you this chart where, um, you know, it showed all the countries and reliance on gas versus nuclear. 28 of the 34 European countries I have there get more, uh, use more gas than nuclear. I mean, if we get swapped, that, think about, you know, the, the reliance you could take off of Russia. And again, France is leading there with 37% of their power coming from nuclear energy. So there was a study out there that showed that we would need about 50 to 150 nuclear reactors to replace all gas and in, in Europe. If each country built about one to four, you know, depending on that number, by 2050, realistically, you can get off it, off gas and be a nuclear. Along the way, you're adding in solar and wind and hydro and other things. But man, oh man, that, that's, that's pretty crazy. And if you think about like the, 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 the downsides to, to nuclear energy, obviously it's the safety. The other big thing that comes out is, you know, the, to build it, you know, what happens when you build it? Well, you know, solar, hydro, and wind farms, they require about 10 to 15 times more concrete and steel than building a nuclear reactor for the same unit of energy produced. People don't talk about that. Let me say, say it to you again. Solar, hydro, and wind systems require about 10 to 15 times more concrete and steel than building a nuclear reactor that produces the same amount of energy. That, that's, that's a great stat. And that's something when people you know, argue with you and say, you know, you have to build these plants stuff. Listen, building the solar and wind and hydro not, isn't that great for the environment either, if that's your reason for doing it. So that brings me back to something that's really important, and that's the SMRs, the small modular reactors. But look at this, folks. This is obviously a drawing of one. This is the new scale power plant. Uh, it's called Voyager, or V-O-Y-G-R. It's a small uh, uh, modular uh, reactor, SMR plant. And this is a drawing for it. And they're starting to build it. And I want to go visit it. You know, I, I'm not sure far how long they are, but it's, it can see what it looks like. So um, speaking of new scale, uh, there is a, a company out there that is uh, signed a deal to go public via SPAC. And I'll talk about that in a second. But it, a, a typical SMR can produce about 300 megawatts of electricity. And that can power over 200,000 homes. The Department of Energy is also already spending money. They spent $1.2 billion to date on SMR and SMR research. And according to the Department of Energy, the DOE, they want to invest in our $5.5 billion. It's big money for, for a little sector. And, you know, the practical application is probably about 10 years away. But this is when, as an investor... You know, early stage, this is when you want to get in. Um, so New Scale I just talked about was a division of Fluor Corporation, uh, F-L-U-O-R, symbols F-L-R. So it's a, it's a big multi-billion dollar company. They decided to spin off New Scale Power. And New Scale spelled N-U-S-C-A-L-E, New Scale Power, uh, through a SPAC merger. And this merger would give that combined entity about a $1.9 billion valuation, including debt. And to bring in about $413 million in proceeds, which will help the company grow. Floor will continue to own 60% of this new company. So let's talk a little bit more about NewScale. I'm going to show you a chart here. It's set to merge with a company called the Spring Valley Acquisition Corp, symbol SV. Uh, they are a provider of these proprietary, innovative, advanced uh, power solutions. And their um, power modules, they call them the NewScale power modules, so NPM. Um, it's really the only near-term viable deplo uh, deployable SMR technology available. So this is the leader, folks. They say that their, uh, their systems are capable of generating 77 megawatts of energy and that it's safe, reliable, scalable, which is important, all three of those things. Um, and they can accommodate um, 
configurations of where they have either four, six, or 12 modules. So basically, it can produce up to 924 megawatts of energy. I just told you 300 does about 200,000 homes. So multiplied it by three, looking at 600,000 homes uh, for one of these facilities that has about 12 modules in it. Um, they were the first company to, to uh, file for an SMR. Uh, it's, it's five year, it's a 12,000 page design certification uh, with the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, it's the first one to have the NRC Nuclear uh, Regulatory Commission complete their, their reviews and they approve the design in record time. So that's very, very important. You can see here on the chart going back, you know, it, SPACs are pet. And then it priced at 10 bucks, and then SPACs had some weird things going on, you know, back in September, October, and now it's back up to 10. And just in the last week, it started moving a little bit and it's since pulled back, but it's at 1044. The expectation is for this deal to close in the second quarter, most likely in the first half of the second quarter. Uh, so probably by the end of May at the latest is my best guess. Um, but as you can see here, uh, it's it's still not that far above, you know, it's uh, it's a uh, SPAC price of ten dollars. So this is one that I am putting on my watch list right now. I have no exposure to it, but putting on it. And the, the reason I say putting a watch list, because I've seen some weird reactions after the merger goes through last year, if the merger went through and it changed its name, it changed the symbol. The majority of the time, the stocks went up big time. It's been a bit of the opposite in the last few months. So it's a wild card as to what will happen when the merger actually closes. They change the name and they change the symbol. So if you want to play it, sure, that's your, that's again, we're here to educate you and you make your decisions. But uh, it, there is a bit of a risk when that happens. So I don't know which way it goes, uh, to be honest with you. But that's one way to play these SMRs, which I think these, again, small modular reactors uh, are going to be the future. Elon Musk has talked about them. Bill Gates has talked about them. I mean, when you have big, some of the richest men in the world backing this technology, uh, and, and Bill Gates, too. I mean, the greenie of all greenies. If he's back in, it, it should tell you something that it's safe. Another company to look at that's involved in this is, is Rolls-Royce. Uh, you know, the Rolls-Royce you think of. That's a, they're a big engine maker. They've built uh, several generations of SMRs uh, for use in nuclear submarines. Uh, and they've been designed for a 440 megawatt SMR. And so it's a small portion of the actual revenue that comes in now, extremely small. Even if it grows, it'll probably still remain a small portion, but this is a way to kind of play the SMRs and, and the future of this. So uh, to me, and I know I've talked about uh, uranium nuclear energy in the past. I, I think it's, I really do. I think there's a great investment opportunity here, folks. Uh, I think you're gonna see some volatility, uh, but I think over time, the only way, and I've said this in the past, the only way that the EU or the US or these specific countries are going to meet their net zero that they're looking for uh, emissions is to have uh, expanded nuclear energy. It's the only way. It's, it's I mean, it's, I don't want to say it's fact because somebody will, will debate me, of course, but it is a fact. I, I just don't think there's any other way they could meet these uh, goals that they have. So they, they're going to start turning to it. I really think they will. In the meantime, the next topic, another investment opportunity, there's been a lot of announcements coming out about LNG, and that's liquefied natural gas. And because Europe is trying to get off uh, Russian gas. They're turning to the U.S. and other countries for liquefied natural gas. And with liquefied natural gas, they basically take the gas, they, they pump it in, and then they liquefy it, put it in these cargo tankers, uh, and they could take it out. Most of these uh, export ports in the United States are in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, uh, more imports are coming to Europe from the U.S., from Australia and Qatar. But most of them are coming from the, the U.S., and you need to have these specialized ports, these export ports and import ports, um, uh, and these obviously very specialized uh, LNG cargo tankers for this to happen. The U.S. LNG exports in March rose 16% from February, month over month, to a new all-time high. That, that's, that's a number that is going to catch month over month. Year over year, it sounds high. Month over month, it's crazy. Of that, uh, in March, that, that the U.S. pumped out, Europe took about 65% of that. Asia took about 12, Latin America 3. 20% are still out there and unknown or didn't report to where they're going. And what's really kind of a red flag here is the European gas inventories right now are about 25% full. Typically, this time of year, they're about 34% full. And the European Commission said they wanted to get 80 by 80% 80 by November 1st, uh, right ahead of the, obviously, the cold season, uh, the winter season, heating season. So to get there, 
and especially if they're cutting off more and more from Russia, you're going to see the, the, the LNG exports from the U.S. really continue to go. Um, Germany, you know, obviously, as I said, largest economy, uh, relying on 49% of their gas, uh, largest economy in Europe, 49% of their gas from Russia. Uh, they are at plans to build two new LNG import terminals. I mean, so you're seeing this happen. And here in the U.S., there's 14 LNG projects that are federally approved but not yet built. Um, so they could roughly, the U.S. could roughly double their export capacity um, if they move forward with all of these. And um, there's only eight that are that are operating right now, export terminals that are operating today. And of the 12 of the 14 that are, that are uh, proposed, they're in the Gulf Coast. That's really where this all comes from, in, in, in the Gulf of Mexico. And that's where that's where it pumps out. And that's where you're going to see all the export terminals coming in. In Europe, overall, I just mentioned two in Germany. There's 30 right now uh, pending projects uh, in the LNG uh, sector for imports. I mean, that's that's a lot of projects. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of investment opportunities. You know, what? and what's really kind of mind-blowing is, the U.S. just began exporting LNG in 2016, so it's only been six years. And right now, we have the world's largest uh, LNG export capacity in 2022. Um, so let's talk about companies. A few, a few ways, a lot of ways, I should say, to play this. The one that most people know about is uh, Chenier Energy, symbol LNG. And you can see the chart here, folks. This is a hell of a chart. Uh, just back last March, it was at 70 or 142. So this has been a double in the last year. Uh, so it's had a hell of a run here in the last uh, 12 months. And let me show you a longer term chart just to give you an idea of where we've come from and where we're at. Uh, this has been moving higher for quite some time now. Um, it did spike, you know, with oil back here and then pull back. So it's been all over, but really LNG is really taking off. And uh, this is when the export started right here. You can see what's happened down in the low 20s. So Chenier Energy was the uh, first company to export LNG from the U.S. And I've followed this company for a very long time, know it well. Uh, this is one that, again, this is kind of the leader. This would, you know, back in the day when you thought of oil and gas, you thought of like ExxonMobil, Chevron. This is the ExxonMobil Chevron of LNG. So this is definitely a big behemoth, large cap way to play this. Another uh, uh, European company you probably you don't hear much about Total Energies, symbol TTE, it's a French company, uh, oil and gas uh, by trade, uh, but they're rebranding uh, their business to focus on renewables and LNG. So they're expecting that their oil business, which, which is about 55% of their business in 2020, to drop to about 30% in 2030. So nearly in half as they look to concentrate, again, on renewables and LNG, liquefied natural gas. Um, and uh, they say they can export to 10% of the uh, global LNG capacity. And they are the second biggest player behind Shell. Uh, so Shell, again, a traditional oil and gas company is a number one uh, exporter of uh, liquefied natural gas of LNG. You know, there's a lot of other ways you can think about playing this, and I'm not gonna dive into all the stocks here today, but, you know, as I mentioned, there's 14 LNG projects right now that are federally approved in the US. Uh, think about the amount of concrete and everything else steel takes to make those. Think about the construction architectural companies that will be behind that. Um, I just mentioned in, in Germany, they have approval for two new import uh, terminals. But also I mentioned all of Europe, there's 30 projects that are pending right now. Even if half those go through, that's 15. Even half the U.S. go through, that's another seven. That's over 20 projects going on during the roaring 2020s here. That we, we have to really look at the companies that are uh, responsible for designing, building, uh, steel, concrete, everything that's needed to build these out. More tankers, you need a lot more tankers, right? So this is how you, you have to think about investing. And the reason I did this topic today is, is, is really twofold. Um, one, I want to educate you on, on this topic because I think it's extremely, extremely important. And two, obviously, you know, to make money, because I think there's a lot of money making opportunities here. And when I go back to the education side, I want you to see how I look at things. So when I read about the UK and having new nuclear power plants, I go down a rabbit hole and I come up with all these other ideas and it leads me to all these other companies and, and different investment opportunities. Um, same thing with LNG. Look at LNG and obviously the headlines recently that Europe's bringing more liquefied natural gas to the United States. Well, how do we make money off this, if at all? And this is what I call that top-down approach, looking to big stories, the big trends, and whittling down to, okay, these are the companies that can benefit from this trend. 
Um, and I do that in everything, whether it be artificial intelligence, electric vehicles, flying cars, or energy uh, in, in this situation. So I, I like to share kind of what I'm doing in my head, what's going on, and where these ideas come from. Uh, so I think I shared quite a few things to get that get the wheels turning here today. Because, uh, I, again, it just th this is a situation where interest rates, yes, they're going to go up. Yes, we have inflation. Will we have a recession at some point in the next eight years in the roaring 2020s? Yeah, possibly more than one. Will we have a bear market? Yes, possibly more than one. Will we have corrections? Yes, several, I'm sure. But you have to look at trends. Does that mean suddenly we stop building nuclear power plants because we need them to reach our goals? No. Does it mean suddenly LNG stops? No. That's how we have to view the market, not this day-to-day -day crap that we hear on TV and we read on the, you know, the, the financial websites. Spooking you, in, spooking you out of the market one day, one week later, you're, you're missing out, creating FOMO, that you have to get back into the markets. That will drive you bananas. You have to buy solid companies and let them go and play it. And that's, that's the best way, the easiest way. I hate to use the word easiest, simplest way to become wealthy in America and you know, outside too, but I know here in America. Invest your money in solid companies that are changing the world, disrupting the world, that are going to be leaders of the next 10 plus years. And looking at what I talked about today, I think we have a lot of leaders in there. So let's take a look at the market real quick before I wrap up. We'll take a look here at the S&P 500. We are down about four tenths of a percent off the lows, off the highs. Again, folks, we're consolidating you know, after this rally. And I think we're just setting up for a new rally. I think we're at new all-time highs in the next couple of months. And I think it's, some people are going to freak out. But of course, the people on financial news say, I told you so. Oh, I knew this was coming. Sure you did. I'm telling you, I think it's coming. So I'm putting my name out there. But again, folks, thank you so much. Remember the three tenets of this show. We are going to educate you. We're going to have fun. And at the end of the day, we're going to make some pretty good damn money. So enjoy the rest of this uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. We'll be back Thursday with our wrap-up of Q1 and more importantly, my outlook for Q2. A lot of stocks. Get your pencil, paper ready. I'm going to throw a huge watch list at you. I'm going to take stocks from my watch list and share it with you. All coming up on Thursday. But thank you so much for watching. Have a great Tuesday, Wednesday. We'll be back Thursday. Once again, this is Matt McCall, and that was Make Me Money. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.